we we're live. We are live. All right. <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, happy Thursday, everybody. Thanks for joining us on this edition of Approaching the Unknown COVID series. Uh, this is our third installment in the series this summer. Uh, and this is a collaborative event with Soul Stories and Approaching the Unknown. Um, most of you are familiar with Soul Stories, but um, Danny is kind of the header of that. And I've been working with him and Chelsea and Hamish and uh, Approaching the Unknown is kind of an initiative to connect scientists and academics and researchers with the community in sort of non-traditional um, ways, uh, mainly through artistic and creative expression mediums. Uh, and so Soul Stories, uh, their mission is to promote human connection through dialogue and a meaningful conversation. So this is kind of the uh, approach that we take in this live stream. Uh, and the focus tonight obviously is on COVID, the COVID pandemic and really trying to amplify community voices and how um, people experience this in ways that maybe you wouldn't hear about otherwise. Uh, and so in the past, we have had um, the owner of the Whittier Cafe spoke last time. Um, and we've also had a grad student before um, and just sort of various uh, members of society that you might not otherwise be connected with. Um, so we're about to get started and I'm about to hand this off to Hamish to start the uh, discussion. But I just also wanna make a quick pitch for our main event, which happens in the winter. Um, and last December we did one, it's called Science Through Creative Expression, where we pair up scientists with local artists and have them produce performance pieces for a live audience. Uh, and so we are planning on doing that again this winter uh, TBD in terms of time in relation to where we're at in the pandemic and if we can do things in person at that point. But it will be happening at some point and we are looking for both scientists and artists to be involved. So if that's something you are interested in, we would love to hear you connect with Soul Stories through their page at the moment. Um, and I'll pass it off to Hamish. Uh, hi everyone. Um, welcome to our last in the series of Approaching, um, approaching the Unknown this one is specifically about COVID biology. So we have two professors uh, today who will be interviewing. Um, and I, as I understand, their research has been kind of redirected in the light of the pandemic in quite unexpected and surprising ways. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and uh, Danny and Kristen will be watching the chat. And maybe at the end of the kind of each session, we'll kind of look to those questions and ask our guests. Um, Feel free to, you know, it can be more than questions. Feel free to interact with each other in the chat as well. Um, so the way this is gonna work is um, each of our guests has 20 minutes um, uh, and then maybe five minutes for questions. Um, so without much further ado, I'd like to welcome our first guest, Elena Shear, who is a professor of uh, allergy and immunology at Anschutz Medical Campus. So welcome, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity today. Um, I guess I'll start talking a little bit about how the pandemic has affected um, my work as a physician, as well as a research scientist. And then I'll talk a little bit about how my research lab has actually pivoted some of the work towards uh, the understanding of uh, the current COVID pandemic mm -hmm. uh, and how I see this is gonna affect mm -hmm. not just the research um, topics and directions that I think many of us investigators are um, kind of molding to, uh, but also how I see this affecting funding opportunities, uh, research and other topics, which is uh, also something that I think is going to happen in the next year, next two years, next three mm -hmm. years. Uh, so as we all know, the effect of the pandemic, it's longer lasting than just the past few months. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the context of um, I'm a, I like to define myself as a physician scientist, which means that I am trained in medicine. I have an MD, I don't have a PhD. I um, have a background in pediatrics and within pediatrics, I specialize in allergy and immunology. Uh, particularly, I mostly see patients who uh, refer to me for a question of whether they have a problem with their immune system, either whether maybe part of their immune system is not working properly, so they get more, they're more than the fair share of infections, or maybe they actually have autoimmune inflammatory complications, or really the merge of the two. 
Um, and then that dovetails into what I do in the research arena. Uh, I have uh, projects where our focus on um, human translational research as in trying to understand a disease. For example, we try to understand pediatric lupus, but we also try to understand um, pediatric genetic disease that affects the immune system. Uh, we also have animal models of these human diseases. So we kind of create the mouse model of that and try to understand underlying mechanisms. And um, when COVID pandemic happened uh, from a clinical standpoint, uh, we essentially had to move most of our clinical visits um, to telehealth. And you can imagine that so my specialty is I see patients refer to me for problems with their immune system, right? So many times, many of them are immunocompromised already. And then now we are facing this pandemic where uh, there is concern for an infection. And in fact, if you have a weaker immune system, it poses you even more a risk. However, um, I get referred new patients and if I don't have a chance to evaluate these new patients and give them a diagnosis and really let the families know that they truly have children with a problem with their immune system, they might not understand the increased risk that they have in the setting of the COVID pandemic. Yeah. So it is this scenario where we really have to decide and weigh the risk of having families come to see us in person because it is, uh, a scenario where I need to arrive at a diagnosis at the moment mm -hmm. and weigh the risk of that with the risk of leaving their house and having exposure yeah. and all of that. So that was challenging in that regard. Uh, for the patients are already under our care, mm -hmm. uh, you can also imagine I have the same question of, I have someone who, for example, doesn't have B cells. They don't make antibody mm -hmm. responses. And they are a patient who maybe now is having issues I need to see and treat, but yet them leaving their house and just coming to see us poses a risk in and of itself. Um, so I would say that for our specialty, this uh, posed some interesting challenges that, again, I think present in other specialties, but I think for us in particular, for that reason. So, so have you, been, over the course of the pandemic, have you been referred COVID patients specifically, or are you dealing with primarily immunocompromised patients who you're then weighing the risk of the COVID? The latter scenario. The patients that usually I'm referred to are uh, questions of does this person have a primary immunodeficiency? And they might or they might not for me to evaluate them. They are a lot of things that I can do by telehealth and I can see them, but you know, I cannot examine them, right? Mm -hmm. um, when I do that. And um, that does pose a you know, limit of the things that I can do, although I can do many things by telehealth and also getting laboratory blood work testing. But even getting blood work for me to yeah. understand their immune system, they have to go somewhere. Um, Are you seeing, uh, have you got many patients who have got COVID-19 and immunocompromised? And have yeah. So that's a great question. Um, as all of this was unfolding, um, like I said, I think from my uh, clinical standpoint, these are the the, the clinical questions I see, and it kind of merges into, from a research standpoint, I study how the immune system misbehaves leading to autoimmunity or maybe underperforms leading to immune deficiency. So as a campus, we uh, started actually uh, focusing on COVID-19 research and really uh, to try to understand what the natural immune response is to this infection, mm -hmm. we need to be able to um, enroll patients who are COVID positive, who might be hospitalized yeah. and, and understand how their immune system behaves in response to that. Mm -hmm. So I became a part of the uh, effort on campus to try to understand how the immune response behaves with this infection. And that uh, is something that is ongoing at the University of Colorado, both from University of uh, Colorado Hospital, the adult hospital, in addition to the pediatric hospital, uh, essentially patients that are positive hospitalized get enrolled. We, um, there are specific exposure surveys that they have to complete questions about history, et cetera. We collect all their clinical data, but we also collect biospecimens, meaning blood draws uh, also. Um, and we uh, look at their immune cells and also serum circulating cytokines, et cetera, to try to understand that. From being pediatric strain, um, 
You might have heard in the news that one of the pediatric presentations has been uh, the multi-system organ failure disease, which in Europe is called PIMS, P-I-M-S. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the US is called MIS-C, but really we're talking about the same thing, basically a systemic inflammatory disease that initially was thought to look like Kawasaki, which is um, a pediatric presentation of um, inflammatory response to a virus is what we think. And um, we have started to see that like in other countries and the, that manifestation has come probably a month and a half after COVID started. Do you have any sense of why that's happening? Because, you know, I have heard mm -hmm. of like flu symptoms resulting in multi-organ failure, for example. Yeah. So it's a very interesting question. Um, I think uh, as a scientist, I would say I have hypotheses and mm -hmm. uh, I am, so I am in the department of pediatrics as faculty, yeah. but in the division allergy immunology, but I'm also actually appointed in the department of immunology and microbiology um, that's where my office, my lab space is. So that's where I spend most of my time where actually my colleagues are PhDs and I'm one of the, an MD in a sea of PhDs, which is very uh, uh, stimulating and I, and I really enjoy that environment. Um, and some of the discussions we have as I like to call a we nerdy immunologists think about this a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, the immune system is quote our organ and um, you know, if you look at COVID started, let's say January, right? January of this year. And um, as part of also of my interest and involvement in starting COVID on campus, I'm actually also part of a international consortia that's called the, Q the COVID human genetic effort. Mm -hmm. In that effort, uh, it encompasses institutions across the US, but also many countries in Europe, Africa, Asia, et cetera. And we have all seen the same trend that if we looked at our institutions and the data, uh, we started seeing COVID in January, February, every country sort of got hit at different times. And then about a one to two month lag time after that, we started seeing the pediatric cases with the MIS-C, okay? One important characteristic of MIS-C, PIMS, however you wanna call it, is that um, the children actually don't experience respiratory symptoms many times. This really only happens in the pediatric age. Um, we're talking um, about this presentation. Clearly, there is a systemic manifestation in the adults as well, and there are similarities there. But in children who present like this, they don't often have respiratory symptoms, and they could be multiple children in the same household who are exposed the same way, and really only one of them, for example, can have this presentation. We think that this might be um, so many theories, but if it's anything like Kawasaki, this is immune complex mediated, meaning that you have infection respond that you make antibodies, those antibodies complex with the virus, and then that complex circulates and can create problems in the lungs, in the heart, in uh, the other organs, etc. That seems to be a plausible explanation, but there's really a lot of work to be done to really quote proof show that that hypothesis is correct. Are you so, sorry. Oh, can I ask a question? Sorry. So with with that oh, with that theory, um, is I guess is that implying that sort of these side effects are less of um, a cause of the virus, but more of our immune system interacting with it and not Absolutely. and not um, making it disappear or not attacking it properly. It's sort of like a buildup almost. It's more of um, in any infection, you always have two sides. You have the virus and you have the host. And the virus can come and cause problems, but your host immune response to that in and of itself can cause problems too. So sometimes the solution is kind of worse than the cause, not to say that the virus is not bad, but the virus came, it elicited an immune response, and then the immune response can be so vigorous and so strong that it actually ends up causing organ damage. But is this why you see um, the sort of variation in severity? Um, but so, you know, that you see such a variation across patients is maybe that, that dynamic? I think that uh, is something that, if you ask me now, we probably would agree on that, as in how, how well you, quote, contain infection, probably you could boil it down to to three categories. One is 
the jur, so I tend to explain to my patients, the immune system is like an army of soldiers and they are destined to fight and eradicate the infection even if they fail. And if they fail, they don't stop. They just keep on trying. So the people that are asymptomatic are the people where the virus came, the soldiers showed up and eradicated it very quickly. No, um, no side effects per se from the attack. The people where the virus showed up and then they had to get hospitalized, they had pneumonias, the virus was significant, the army still showed up, but it took them a little while. I mean, that time the person became sick and then your army completed the eradication and that was them. Then you have the scenario where for some reason your immune system didn't develop a robust enough response. And actually when you look at the papers that have been published, the more inflammatory severe picture of COVID where you have really high inflammatory markers, uh, you're in the hospital, there's organ damage beyond pneumonia. When you look at the T cells, which is an important immune response of these people, they tend to have an exhausted phenotype. So that can happen in your immune cells if they fight and they're activated for a long time and they just cannot eradicate the organism, they don't stop trying. They keep on going to the point of getting exhausted. When that happens and you have a lot of your inflammatory markers and cytokines that come up, primary IL-6, you might have seen in the news, sort of some of the trials using anti-IL-6, and that's to really calm down the response of the host. So it's a little bit counterintuitive that in the setting of this infection, when you're really sick, you actually have to suppress the immune response of the host to get control so, of how sick you are. So the people that we see in hospital, are they more a consequence of the virus getting out of control or the host immune system getting out of control? That's a great question. Um, I think by and large, um, there have not been a lot of great studies on measuring the amount of virus in the blood. So to answer your question, is it a question of viral load? I think what you're saying, it boils down to, is your viral load so high that you can't control? Mm -hmm. To really show that, you would have to show data that the people in the severe phenotype, and when you check their viral count, mm -hmm. it appears to be higher. Mm -hmm. The question is, where do you check that? Because the blood may not be the best place to do it in the lung. Um, they're really trying to minimize procedures of say doing a bronchoscopy or bronchoalveolar lavage because of risk. So then you're looking at intubation, looking at tracheal aspirates and assessing viral load there. I think there's a question whether that's the best place. But what we have seen is we're not sure if the higher viral load directly proportionally equates with more severity, but what is clear is that the people with severe disease have really high ESR CRP. Those are inflammatory markers. They have really high levels of IL-6. That's an inflammatory cytokine. Those are all signs of actually your host response being really strong. So I think I'm leaning towards saying that the severe phenotype is because of the host response. Okay. Okay. Um, so that, um, mm -hmm. that kind of further supports a, almost a genetic theory of, of what may be causing these, this difference in response. Have, yeah. have you done any investigation on that aspect of it? Yeah. So there's a couple of, um, studies out there and what we know so far that I think supports that there is a strong genetic component to this disease. I think the question is, what is that magical genetic component and why does that particular we haven't identified we have hypotheses as to what genes they could be because well if you if the people who are more severe get a really high il6 amount in their blood and you can detect that if you have a mutation that maybe is in sort of the genes or the areas that control il6 well maybe that puts you at higher risk of landing in that scenario right but we don't know but what we do know is that there's a predilection in the severe disease. We see a high group of Hispanic and African-American. Um, when you look at the pediatric area and who are the kids who get MIS-C, the systemic disease, uh, it is also a Hispanic and African-American propensity. I don't think that is chance. 
Um, I think the severe disease we see in kids and the severe disease we see in adults and that uh, predilection for a certain ethnicity mm -hmm. does tell us something about a genetic component. We always have to be careful because there's also with particular ethnicity issues with uh, access to care, for example, and whether that could be a confounder. Um, but this is why uh, I was very excited to be part of this international human genetic effort because to really understand that, I think you have to have a fairly uh, diverse population. Uh, diverse in terms of symptoms, you need to have, you need to look up people that were positive but asymptomatic, positive, hospitalized, positive, severe, but also from diverse races and ethnicities, right? And this requires an international effort. So, so if, um, is this shaping how you're trying to find treatments for COVID then? Uh, so like what, what would be your first line of inquiry for a treatment then if you think the immune system is the primary driver of the, the symptoms yeah. we observe? That's a great question. Um, so I think in terms of treatment, as you've seen the news, just like I like to frame the infection as there's the virus and that's the host immune response. So when you think about treatment, there's the treatment of attacking the virus, but there's a treatment of modulating the host immune response, right? So it falls in those two arms. Treatment for the virus, you're looking at antivirals. Treatments for immune, modulating the immune response, then you're looking at biologics uh, or other small molecules that particularly target either particular cytokines or a particular immune pathway. Mm -hmm. So in my mind to better design targeted therapies that are gonna be um, least amount, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, least amount of side effects, but um, higher amount of um, higher effect, I think it would be important to, to understand in the people who recovered and the people who, who basically had disease that were hospitalized to recover, look at their T cells, look at their B cells, and look at what, um, how they look. Because we know that if you develop an immune memory, mm -hmm. your cells look in a certain way, we can study that and we can understand durability of response because that's something that we still don't know with this virus and the immune cells once they become memory they do express certain qualities that we can assess so to me that would be one of the first things to do nice. just for um for our non-academic uh, or phd viewers could you just give a brief summary of the difference between b and t cells and how they relate yeah. to the immune system no absolutely um, I, I was going to move to actually more quiet place for a second. Um, sorry, dinner time is a busy one. Um, so the, the T cells and B cells uh, in the immune system, if you think about them as an army, uh, I would say that the B cells are the cells that make antibodies. And this antibodies are the ones that go and block the virus. Uh, they are actually what's being measured in the serology assays. So you've heard in the news that you want to check whether, you know, you are seropositive or negative, meaning were you, did you see the virus in the past and did you make an antibody response against it? So the B cells are quite powerful in that way. However, for the B cells to actually make these antibodies and then hang around and last for a long time, they do need a strong T cell collaboration. So your T cells don't make things, don't secrete things that go out to block your virus, but they can actually directly um, attack the virus as long as they can quote see it, which they need antigen presenting cells. But you need them to kind of help the T cells to develop the antibody and the long-term memory response. So we're kind of getting to the end of this session. Was there any questions in the chat, Kristen? No, doesn't seem to be any. So I think like with my last question, um, with my last question, I wanted to ask about how this experience of doing research during COVID-19, you think will affect your research going forward, both in kind of your direction, but also just the kind of atmosphere of doing research without everyone around, you know? Yeah, um, I think um, 
like I said, uh, we are a lab who uh, studies immune response in um, disease in general. So understanding what the immune response is like in COVID, I think is uh, a reasonable and sort of somewhat even logical pivot to uh, take at this point. Um, I do think what I want to say, the effect that we're gonna see down the line next year and the year after that is uh, budgeting of funding sources for research mm -hmm. and things are gonna be shifted and actually gonna become more astringent. Mm -hmm. Our ability to work in a research lab is limited also by social distancing. So we can't have five people working, we can only have three people working and that is gonna affect what we can do in a timely manner. Okay, but do, do you think there's gonna be, uh, is there any kind of new collaborations that have been started within COVID-19 that you think will expand going forward even beyond the pandemic itself? Absolutely. Um, I think uh, as we've been discussing that uh, there is, I, I don't think I have been in SNR before in my research career, which is not tremendously long, but durable, um, that I have not seen this many international investigators be focusing on the same topic at the same time okay. for this long before. Um, and they have been collaborations formed that I would have never expected to happen uh, without COVID because there is this one elephant in the room that we're all trying to tackle, to quote, move on past other things, right? Um, and uh, the participation in this COVID human genetic effort, for example, that is international that involves multiple investigators, immunologists across the world. Mm -hmm. I have never seen that happen before in the context of any other disease. So I do think that will continue. Thank you so much for sharing that perspective. Um, we do actually have a, actually two questions kind of about the same thing, interestingly enough, if you don't mind, sure. just really quickly. Um, several people were wondering about the uh, relationship of um, blood type A potentially being a risk factor for the more severe inflammatory phenotype. Apparently there's some something going around about that. Several people were wondering. Yeah, so I have seen this study, uh, I will say, one thing that I have also seen in COVID that I haven't seen before, uh, I think the publications that come out of it are a little bit like fast and furious. Uh, as, as a scientist myself, I submit publications, but I also review them. Um, I have seen many, many studies that were probably not the most carefully conducted uh, and then get published pretty quickly because there's such a push and impetus for let's just learn more. Um, and things get published and actually the studies that come behind it to say, well, maybe that was no so significant. Um, they don't kind of get publicized as much. So for example, the originals of, you know, if you had a VCG vaccine before that primes your immune system, therefore actually makes you more protected against COVID severe disease, which was published and people discuss further. That has then follow up studies have shown that actually didn't pan out. In the context of the blood type, um, it has to do for you to have certain particular blood types. So blood type O, A, B, um, think about it. It's like sugar decorations on a certain protein. And you have specific sugars, your A, you have specific sugars, your B. And kind of the data there was shown that if you're this blood type and you require to have this specific sugar decoration, it does make your immune response in a certain way. And remember that I just discussed that severity is more related to your host immune response. And therefore, if you're at this blood time, maybe your host immune response is less of this way and that makes you less at risk. I think there needs to be a lot more work and studies done there. Um, and I, I wouldn't hang my hat on that just yet. Um, so thank you so much. I think, I'm not sure what, if, you're, if you need to leave or not, but do we have any more questions, Kristen, in that intermediate? We do. It's it's up to you. Sorry. If you have time, we'd love to hear more. Hear. Um, yeah, if you sure. need to go, we totally understand. Yeah, it's okay. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, people are just mm -hmm. uh, the, they're just storming with questions now. Okay, um, we had another one um, from Lindsay wondering if there's one thing that every layperson slash voter should know about the coronavirus that you could impart to them. What would that be? Well. Um, That's I know it's a big okay. ask. One thing, but yeah, I think. I will say about the one thing about sort of COVID pandemic, um, this is probably not news to a lot of people, but 
through this international effort, uh, I have gotten the chance. We get on Zooms every week, 60, 70 investigators from all over the world discussing this. Um, so I get to see how each different country has been handling the pandemic. In the question of national effort and resources devoted to the research, as well as effort and resources devoted to frontline people uh, actually supporting the clinical care. I will say that whenever I'm on those meetings and I see what other countries have been able to do, um, I, I think we're often short. So I think uh, as in the news, we don't get to see much about how is Japan handling it? How is Singapore handling it? How is South Africa handling it? And I get to hear the incidence rate, the uh, screening that they do, how they're studying, how much money is being devoted to it, what is being done. Um, and we come short in most aspects. Yeah, that's very, that's very sad. Is there any country that you think doing particularly well then? Uh, any country that is, I'm sorry? I think it's like, is, any, is there any country that's kind of leading the research then? into COVID-19? Yes, um, there are several. Uh, so I would say um, I have seen some very nice work on NAS studies uh, in Montreal and Canada. Um, there's some very nice work also coming out of uh, Australia. I mean, this has to do with kind of the investigators that we yeah. get on mm -hmm. and there's some immunologists gravitating to some areas. Um, I've seen uh, also some very nice work done by a group in Singapore. Okay. Um, it is interesting that in Singapore, for example, they did have the experience of SARS mm -hmm. when it happened many years ago. And that actually motivated them to establish a whole unit to just dedicate it to uh, pandemic research, really. Um, I think it's uh, pain one time makes you learn. Mm -hmm. um, and they were very, uh, they had a very nice structure to uh, do research that was pre-existing because of that. So, any more questions, Kristen? Or yeah, actually, we did have another one. If if oh. if you have time, really quickly, um, Chelsea was wondering how the response of the scientific community um, to this pandemic compares to the response to AIDS, the surge of AIDS research in the 1980s. Yeah, that's a great question because actually, what I keep hearing um, from the scientific community, uh, who actually uh, in these discussions, I've been lucky to be in a group with scientists who were uh, doing the research back then and still doing research now. Uh, and they all say, this is like when HIV happened and how it was happening. So I think there's a lot of resemblance. I cannot speak for that as I was not in the world of research then. Uh, but the discussions about uh, how the investigators from many areas of the country and multiple countries came together, uh, how, um, from a vaccine development and sort of jumping a little bit through the red tape of FDA, et cetera, how that was expedited, accelerated. I think they say that there's a lot of similarities that they see. So I do think that there's a lot of uh, closeness there. Ooh. So. Are we, I think, are we, are we done with questions, Kristen? Yeah, I, I think that um, pretty much wraps it up. I mean, there's tons more we could ask you, but we got to let you get out of here. Um, yeah. But thank you so much for, for taking yeah. part in this. Um, this was really informative um, to me, and I hope I hope our viewers enjoyed it. We'll be, uh, we'll be posting the recording of this to the, um, the Soul Stories page, um, so people can go back and, and listen again if you want to kind of pick up on some more details a little bit more, maybe replay, because <laughs> yeah. um, there's so much in there. So thank you so much, Elena. Um, we really appreciate your time. Okay, thank you for having me. Thank you, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. So, um, we have a bit of a free free moment now. We haven't got our second guest is not with us yet. So do we want to just talk about our plans for December and our main event and the kind of people we're looking for? Um, you know, scientists not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so we're waiting on Tim Benke. Hopefully he uh, will show up and I'm sure he'll have a ton of interesting things to say as well. Um, but yeah, in the meantime, I sort of alluded to this at the beginning of of the session, but we do have an event that is 
um, it's really performance based. Um, and so sort of the reasoning behind that is to try and get uh, scientists and academics to engage with community in just very non-traditional ways. Uh, and this has the purpose of sort of taking um, everybody kind of out of their preconceived notions of what a scientist is or what a lay person is or what an artist is and really um, sort of challenging those definitions and allowing people to engage with scientists and with artists in more of a, a human capacity past just their labels and the role that they fill in society but uh, giving these people an opportunity to express themselves um, in a way that they wouldn't otherwise. And we had a really cool event last winter um, where this, we, we managed to achieve this. Um, and, you know, it was, it was a little risky. We weren't sure how it was going to work taking scientists who are used to just standing and talking at, in front of a PowerPoint uh, and asking them to perform on stage. But it went amazingly well, I think. I, I had the opportunity to participate and I learned a ton. Um, but like Amish was saying, we are in the process of looking for participants for the upcoming version. Uh, and Hamish, you want to talk a little bit about like kind of what we're looking for in those <laughs> participants? Yes. Well, I, I think one of the most important things to kind of point out that we're looking for in scientists is we're not just looking to hear about, if you're a scientist and interested in taking part, we're not just interested in the science that you're doing, but also your experience in science and doing that science. And so I think everyone has a kind of different relationship with their professor, with doing the research with their institution that they're at. Uh, and lots of like kind of personal struggles in there. And we're interested in enabling that story to be told as well. So right. it's, uh, it's, it's not really a science communication event. It's yeah. so I, I think it's a platform to communicate themselves, but not necessarily their research as much. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's part of how we're trying to kind of re redefine what a scientific narrative is and, and how to communicate that. Yeah, so just like riffing on that for a moment, I think that there's a lot of cliches around what science is. Um, and I think you can think of maybe, you know, lots of like sticky goo or little experiments you do at home. But we think there's a kind of very rich world out there that isn't often explained to people outside of science. And so we're kind of really excited to kind of bring that to you. And so if you're a scientist with an interesting story in any sort of way, please get in touch. And equally if you're so a scientist that's also a human, yeah. <laughs> you'll have interesting stories. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. And so that's something we're definitely, definitely very interested in. Yeah, and then obviously also on the artist side, um, you know, uh, it's, you know, we're not trying to ask you to hold, we, don't, we won't be asking you to hold the scientist's hand and walk them through this. Mm -hmm. Part of our request for scientists is that, like Cambridge was saying, you do have to come with something to say mm -hmm. and have an idea of how to approach that. Um, so it is a collaboration rather than somebody being kind of dragged along. Um, but, you know, still as an artist, we want people who are able to kind of um think about you know think about creating think about representing ideas that aren't traditionally represented through art uh, yeah. and that is a challenge <laughs> um but one that i think everyone really learns a lot from in the process um some of the feedback that we got from participants with this last one was just seeing all the common ground uh, between the artists and scientists even though they're two supposedly separate fields the way that people who you know are very passionate about what they do approach their work is is very similar uh and there's a lot of common ground that our participants found with each other which is something that was really cool to come out of this as well um so yeah if that sounds at all appealing to you or if you know anybody who wants to participate we are going to get started on that recruitment search this summer after this since this is our last session of the live stream that's going to be what we're working on next. Um, please, right now, contact us through Soul Stories, um, and yeah, <laughs> spread the word. <laughs> it was a really awesome event, and I hope we'll be able to have it in person <laughs> at some point. Um, so, so Kristen, was there, you know, just going back to Elena's segment, was there anything that stood out to you particularly um, that was particularly intriguing? Uh, I just I appreciated her distinction of the. I guess the causes of the COVID symptoms and sort of the underlying root of that, because I think most of us assume that the virus is doing something that's, you know, negative, like it's the virus that's affecting us, but really it sounds like in a lot of the more severe cases, unfortunately it's our own immune response that's sort of 
uh, working against us and and causing that severe inflammation phenotype that we don't always see with these flu flu viruses normally. Um, so I, I appreciated sort of her perspective on that. You know, it's subtle, it's nuanced, different, but I think it affects how we think about this uh, for sure. And it was also interesting, um, yeah, just hearing from a, a pediat pediatric perspective. That's one of the things I've always been curious about is, you know, it doesn't seem like children are quite as affected by it as the rest of the population. Um, it's just interesting kind of hearing. I suppose it makes quite a lot of sense that the kids that get it very get very severe symptoms are in fact reacting not to the virus as much as like it's just their immune system is getting a bit out of control and it's you know it'd be unsurprising that a child has the most overactive immune system you know yeah no definitely um, um, yeah and it was also just it was neat to hear um of the way that i mean i know that the scientific community is like coming together around this idea um, but from somebody who's a leader in their field and is literally on Zoom with, you know, people around the world uh, about this, that was, that was pretty neat to hear about um, that kind of, that level of collaboration among scientists. Mm. And that's the way, it's always reassuring to hear that, you know, sometimes I hear stories of, you know, brutal rivalries in academia and it's nice to hear people kind of coming together in the face of a crisis, you know? Um, yeah, absolutely. Danny, yeah. you're lurking over there. Do you have any interesting takeaways? Um, yeah, I mean, the whole response, like the immune system response was incredibly surprising to me. I didn't think that, and you know, she she was talking from like a perspective where I think she clarified a few times that she's still doing a lot of research on this, um, but that signs are pointing to it is more based in the immune system responses like that's fucking wild like i i mean i'm not in the science field um and i'm i'm just curious how, like what will come of that like what would the so, yeah, just vaccine like to... or whatever you would call it do or you know you know what i'm trying to say yeah yeah, yeah. and she i think she kind of did touch on that a little bit um we were sort of talking about yeah like and that understanding does have implications for the kind of vaccine that you develop absolutely is it one that targets the virus and tries to wipe that out or is it one that tries to suppress the immune response and that's a crucial difference <laughs> yeah, that's a huge yeah that sounds huge mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that so totally for, changes how you think about it so for people that have just tuned in maybe in the last five minutes we're currently just waiting for our second guest uh dr tim Benke. um We'll see what happens. So that that's why that's why you maybe not be seeing a professor right now. Um, and so we're just discussing uh, Elaine, our previous guest, talk briefly while we wait. So, Amish, what uh, what was your takeaway from that? <laughs> um, I know. I guess I'm always interested in the political side, and I thought it. I obviously I had a sense that uh, you know America wasn't doing the best job with the UK either. And it's kind of interesting to hear that there are other countries that are taking a much more proactive stance, much more aggressive in trying to do research here. And I guess that, uh, I guess I kind of knew that, but it's interesting just hearing that like firsthand experience of kind of seeing that in the real world, you know, um, seeing people compare the facilities they have, you know. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, their um, government's approach to science. <laughs> hey. Ah, Dr. Benke. Welcome. Timing. <laughs> Welcome. Can you hear hey, us? Sorry, I'm late. No worries. No, no right. We're uh, we're gonna we can fill some time. That's <laughs> we can we can riff. <laughs> Thank you so much for for tuning in. Sure. Uh, I'm I'm Kristen, and um, Hamish over there is I'm the one who, who emailed you initially, uh, and we're uh, on the Anschutz campus in the genetics program as PhD students, and um, basically this live stream is uh, sort of the child of um, our collaboration with a group called Soul Stories, which Danny there runs, whose purpose is to c promote um, connection through dialogue and and meaningful conversations. Uh, and so I've been, Hamish and I have been collaborating with him to uh, find ways to connect scientists and academics to the community um, that sort of go beyond their traditional means of doing so and kind of kind of change up the dynamic a little bit. Um, though this live stream is kind of a product of that. Uh, and tonight we're talking about COVID research uh, and biology. Uh, Elena Saya was just on with us and just had a really 
really interesting perspectives to share. Um, but we would really love to hear from you about just, I don't know how this is impacting your work, uh, your life as a scientist. Has this shifted your direction of your research focus? Um, anything you want to share, we'd love to hear about it. Yeah, welcome. Sure. So uh, I don't know what Elena spoke about, but um, you know, a lot of people have been impacted by how the lab shutting down on the Anschutz campus has impacted the research. Um, and I think my experiences in that regard are pretty similar to a lot of people, how we just weren't able to get back into the labs for um, from you know, March 13th on until when we were just allowed to get back in three weeks ago. So that's pretty, I think a lot of people have that experience. Um, but I've had a different experience in terms of what I do for clinical research. And my clinical research focuses on rare neurogenetic disorders. And one of the disorders is called Rett syndrome. And Rett syndrome is involves, as you as genetic students, maybe you know this, but it involves uh, a new mutation. So it's not inherited necessarily from the mom or the dad. It's a new mutation in a gene called MECP2. And the girl, it's the gene where this, um, the chromosome where this gene lives is on the X chromosome. So primarily girls are affected. Uh, we think that, um, it might be that the mutation actually happen, arises in sperm. And so that's why we think that girls are predominantly affected. But we, we don't know the answer to that. Nevertheless, the girls seem to develop normally for the first 12 to 18 months of life. And then they quit talking, they quit using their hands, and it becomes apparent that they're not able to, to walk or sit as well as they used to be. And they also develop some very characteristic hand movements as well. So the girls that have this, they, they have uh, what we call a locked-in syndrome. So you might see the girl in a, in a wheelchair and not see her able to communicate, but she is aware of everything that's going on. And when you provide these girls with an augmentative communication device, it becomes clear that they know a lot more than you are able to give them credit for. Um, their listening and reading comprehension is sometimes at grade level. Uh, I heard a story from one of the patients that I saw in clinic a couple of weeks back before she was actually one of the last patients we saw before the shutdown. Uh, and she didn't get an augmentative communication device until she was in her thirties. And the parents didn't know, but she knew how to spell and read. And when she got her device, it opened up a whole new world for the family um, that she, she was actually able to talk to them. So that's, those are some of the aspects of Rett syndrome. But one of the, the issues is, is that uh, when they get sick, they don't do very well with coughing and clearing their secretions. And so we had, it's, it's, it's very exciting. We had three clinical trials that were active for our patients with Rett syndrome. And they were all designed to improve their Rett syndrome. They weren't targeting a, a, a symptom like seizures. They were really targeting their Rett syndrome. And it was really disappointing for everybody, the investigators across the country, but also the, the families that we had, to, we had to take the patients out of the trial because we couldn't carry on doing the trial without seeing the patients on a regular basis. We couldn't bring them into the hospital because we didn't think it was safe. I couldn't go to their house to do the assessments because I wasn't sure that's, that was safe. Um, and so we, we had to uh, take them out of the trial. So that was really disappointing for the investigators and the families uh, to, to do that. Um, and the, the concern that, that we have, and I think that may be a point for bigger discussion, is my concern was is if we're doing this trial at, at the onset and maybe the peak of a pandemic, what will happen if my patients get sick and they have to be in the ICU? 
I, I know this disease. I can advocate for them if they're in my hospital. Because what will happen is, is somebody's going to say, we've got a neurotypical individual and we have somebody who's not. And we have a limited resource in our ICU with ventilators or bed space. Mm. What's, what decision is going to be made there? And I felt that with that backdrop, that I had to do everything that I could to protect my patients. So I wasn't gonna take any risks with trying to bring them in or do house visits or anything. Before I knew what was going on, it, it needed to, to be shut down so that we could protect our patients. And we're, we're still in, I think in that situation is, are we gonna see another peak with the pandemic such that we're gonna start reaching capacity with our ICUs and what's gonna happen to our patients and our children who have neurodevelopmental disorders mm -hmm. and we're faced with rationing. So, so do, do RETS patients often uh, end up in ICUs for other respiratory infections or is that? Uh, they, they do, they don't do well when they have the flu. Yeah, okay. So a lot of my patients with RET and related disorders such as CDKL5 deficiency disorder, they, they don't do well and they end up in the ICU with, with reg, regular flu. So over the course of the pandemic, have you found your role as a, a researcher of Rett's disease more, is it is the researcher doing more important or the kind of patient advocacy become more of your kind of? Well, I don't think that you can separate the two really, mm -hmm. um, I, but I, I do both. I'm, I'm very involved with the patient advocacy groups um, I've, I've been putting, um, advice on one of the patient advocacy group websites about, you know, here we are and every month or so, and actually I'm due now to, to update what, what they've been putting on their websites with, in terms of, um, advising families. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're, you know, every community is going to be different. You know, if you're in a community that's on the East coast, that's still, still very much suffering, you know, where you are with your, when you're going to bring back patients, even for seeing them in regular clinic visits versus clinical trials is going to be very different compared to other parts of the country. And so I think that the, the advice is going to be in some degrees geographic specific. Mm. You know, I think we're in a much better place here in Colorado. Um, we've started seeing patients in the hospital mm. and, you know, I, I don't know what it's going to be like, but I'm trying to see what the spike does over the next three or four weeks. But we would like to, to restart our clinical trials in July mm -hmm. if things stay at a reasonable level. When you restart your clinical trials, are you able to go back to where you were or do you have to kind of start kind of the trial from the beginning, if it were? That, that's a good question. And one of the things that we, so the way the trials work is they almost all, they were all um, randomized double blind. Okay. So I don't know who was getting what, but mm -hmm. that was the first part of the trial. And the second part of the trial was an open label extension. So if you are on placebo, then you go over to the drug, or if you're on drug, you continue on drug. And that's a nice thing that the company was doing and the industry was doing such that everybody you know, gets to, mm -hmm. to see the drug. It's good for them, good for their data, but it's also good for the families because they're desperate for something that might improve the symptoms in their, their, ch their children. So some of the patients, I was able to get them to the point where they'd finished the first part and they could have gone into open, could have rolled them over in an open label extension, but I couldn't because they stopped there. But we, we advocated with the companies to alter their protocol so that those patients could re-enter the trial. And so when they re-enter the trial, they will go into open label extension. And from like kind of preliminary results, is it looking like these drugs are working or how does-, how does... I'm blinded, I don't know. <laughs> so, so, so none of your patients are yet on the open label? No, oh. not yet, not yet. So, so we'll, we'll see, hopefully in July, you know, we might be able to do that. I did have one patient who we, so when you do a clinical trial, there's 
there's usually a screening visit where you make sure that they qualify. Mm -hmm. And if they qualify, then, you know, a few weeks later, they start the trial. And I had one, one subject who went into screening, but then the pandemic hit. And so we had to screen failure, but she's going to be allowed to to change the protocol so she can actually come back into the trial, but she will have to start all over, but she's just starting. She just has to do the screening visit. So it's, it's not, it's a a bit of a hassle, but not a, a huge hassle. So will having to restart this treatment have uh, like a biological impact on the patients? Is that? We, is that we don't know. We don't, we don't yeah. think so. We, we still think it would be useful. So and that, this is a phase three trial and a, a couple of the patients were already in the phase two trial a couple of years ago. So they might have seen drug before. We don't know. Mm-hmm. But they're still allowed to go into the trial. So, so there's in, in hospitals right now, there's no there's no protections for people that come in already immunocompromised. There's no like separate wing for them well, or anything. Well, we, the, the hospital is, is very tightly screened and orchestrated. Everybody that works there, myself, when I go in, I'm screened. I fill out a questionnaire. I, our temperature's taken. We get a mask. Everybody that works at children's hospital, if you have symptoms, then, then there's, access to testing and, and contact tracing and all that. So all that's in place for the people that work at the hospital. And everybody that comes into the hospital from outside, they're screened at the door. And if you're a patient in the hospital, every patient in the hospital, for whatever reason, is screened with the test for COVID. Hmm. So, hmm. you know, in, in terms of if you're going somewhere, the hospital is is one of your safest places, mm-hmm. believe it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's not as safe as staying at home, but uh, it's, if you have to go out, it's safe. And, th- and that's one of the issues as well. You know, I think not just Rett syndrome and other diseases, I think a lot of people have delayed treatment because they were concerned about the pandemic. Mm. I'm one of them. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I, I broke this early in May, but I didn't do anything about it because I yeah. thought it was just a sprain, but I wasn't going to do anything. Um, so I, I, when, I when did you realize, when did you realize you'd broken it? Well, I went to Dr. Google. Dr. Google said, if it's still hurting after four weeks, you should go see the doctor. So I did. <laughs> it took you four weeks. Wow. Yeah. wow. But yeah, I, so that, that seems like kind of, a, I suppose, a, an un- somewhat unanticipated consequence of all this is yeah, the but, delay of people who who, who need other kinds of medical treatment. Yeah, we, have... we've, there are stories of, you know, of our patients, not necessarily here, but in other parts of the country who had other issues and they were f- afraid to go into the hospital because of this. Mm-hmm. And I think that the answer is, is if, you know, if you're sick, you need to go to the hospital. Mm-hmm. So don't, don't delay treatment. It, it, it's, the hospitals are set up to be as safe as they can. You know, at, at Children's, we've got this whole, it's all mapped out. It's a one-way system to try to minimize mm-hmm. contact with the people that are there. Um, and I think that this is something else to, to talk about is that if we're going to feel safe as a community, we need to protect the people that we think are essential workers. And it's not mm-hmm. just not just the people in healthcare, but for me and my patients with developmental disabilities, I consider essential workers teachers and mm-hmm. therapists. Mm-hmm. What, are my, what are my patients going to do in the fall? Mm-hmm. They need to be in an environment where they're protected from getting sick. And it means that as a community, we have to protect our teachers. So if mm-hmm. I go to a restaurant or go out to the mall, I don't know who I'm walking past, but that could be a teacher mm-hmm. or a therapist. It's, it's, it's compassionate. It's considerate if we're all wearing masks. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you for sharing that and reminding us of all that because that is absolutely essential. Um, yeah, is the, um, are there, are you interacting with therapists specifically for um, the genetic disorders that you're working on that, that counsel those kinds of patients? And um, is there, do you know Yeah, we have a special uh, clinic specifically for Rett syndrome and we have, mm-hmm therapists within the clinic that know the disease well. And so they're able to make specific assessments and which is useful because they're, they're not necessarily the one that's there that 
um, patients, therapists in the community, but they're able to pass on specific therapy recommendations when the, the patient goes back out into the community and inter interfaces with their regular therapist. I imagine they have probably had to adjust those in light of current events and- Well, is there basically some kind of all of my almost all of my patients yeah, if they're just... getting therapy, they're getting it via telehealth. Yeah. It is, you know, physical therapy via telehealth is not really physical therapy. Yeah. Right. And it's, it's hard to teach somebody how to use a, an augmentative communication device as a speech therapist via telehealth. It really requires you to be right there with the patient. So mm -hmm. this is something that really worries me when yeah. school's supposed to start in the fall is how are we going to get therapy for our patients? Because most of them get it through the school district. So um, these patients who are getting therapy, is it kind of something that is ongoing for their entire life or is it something that's very specific to kind of the beginning of their education and once they kind of have a grasp of this augmented communication they need less or well I, ideally you want it um to begin as early as possible but it does need to continue um lifelong and this is this is kind of a problem with our system is is that um, our system is set up such that you go through school and you can get um two to three extra years of high school mm which means you're 21. But when you're 21, if you've needed speech therapy, physical therapy all your life, it's, it's then cut off. There is really limited opportunities. You go from basically having social interactions and therapies on a regular basis, you turn 21 and then there's nothing. Mm. And families, it, it's really difficult for families when, when our patients turn 21 to find either care homes or um, day programs that are uh, safe, useful, and meaningful for our patients. So this, with Rett syndrome, the median life expectancy is 50s. So there's, there's a lot going on. And you know, again, you're 30 years old and, and finally you get your access to a talker and your family realizes that you can spell. All right. So it's family now sorry, if, oh, if I could interject here, I think we yeah. have some comments and, and questions sure. in the, the audience side of things, if you don't mind getting into some Yeah, no, go quickly. for it. Um, okay, what if you actually... So, we have uh, Jean. Jean. Jean is a mom to a child with a rare genetic disorder with developmental disabilities, and she wanted to say thank you for your advocacy and that scenario you mentioned of limited ICU beds um, and her child being declined is, is very disturbing and scary to her. Um, thank you for sharing that, Jean. And do you have, I know, do you have any thoughts on parents as some advice to how to navigate this kind of scenario or? Well, I, I always say that, that, that parents are the biggest advocates for their child and uh, I think that that's, that's going to be just as important, if not more important now in the middle of this. And I think that, you know, I would love to see a, a commercial on TV about, you know, I wear my mask for all my patients. I wear my mask for my therapists and teachers, for my kids' therapists and teachers, mm -hmm. so that we can get more um, social awareness of, of how important this is about protecting everybody as much as we can in the community for two reasons. We want our kids to get therapies and we don't want to have another spike mm -hmm. so that we're even thinking about having to ration health care. Right. I mean, I think, I think it's, it's less of a concern now, but I think the next few weeks with how things have opened up, we'll, we'll know more. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, a couple of other comments that are sort of related to each other, talking about the health precautions in place at the hospital and for the staff. Um, Rosemary was saying that a there's a piece of evidence that she's seen that in New York hospital, hospital workers in New York have a lower rate of COVID than the general public in New York, um, and also some places in San Diego as well. Um, so that's promising that these protocols are actually effective in, in keeping the hospitals as safe as possible. 
Uh, and then let's see. Okay, question. Do you think teachers and therapists would be safer if everyone had a monthly stipend so parents wouldn't need to go to work in order to cover basic necessities like in many other countries? <laughs> sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is there... I... Oh, go ahead. I was going to, I've got a question though, actually. Is there, um, from your experience during kind of corona, the, the coronavirus pandemic, is there anything you're learning about how to treat patients that you wouldn't have learned maybe if it wasn't during a pandemic that you will kind of continue to do moving forward? Uh, for me, no, not necessarily. Okay. Uh, no, no new insights there. Okay, that's unfortunate. Yeah. I don't know. But. Um, yeah, and then also something that we kind of talked to Elena a bit about as well is, um, I guess sort of along those lines, the nature of collaboration um, either within this country, but also the other countries, um, as as we're all confronting this as scientists, as clinicians, uh, what has your experience with that kind of collaboration been like? Um, I've been doing my best through the patient advocacy groups to try to, uh, you know, if if any any patients in the U.S. or in Europe, if they know of patients who've had with Rett syndrome who've had COVID, you know, what what was it like for them? Were there what can we learn from you? So I have contacts in, in Italy and the UK. And fortunately, I haven't heard of any that have in, in Europe. And I, I kind of thought that, you know, because things spiked so early over there, we might hear something, but I haven't heard any. There's, I know of one, one patient on the East Coast of the US who, with Rett syndrome who had it. She did okay. Apparently there's another one in Louisiana, but I don't know any more details on that. But fortunately, I think what families have done, have, they've done a really good job of isolating their kids so that we don't know of any patients who've, it just might be that they, nobody's gotten it because everybody's been very good about um, isolating their kids. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, Jean was also commenting a similar thing that with their, their daughter, um, they've been very, protective with her and careful about staying home, um, but it is draining. She also was wondering if you are at all cautiously optimistic about a vaccine and or treatments by a year end or the first quarter of next year. Um, I, I think that having a vaccine is, is gonna be critical to achieving some sense of normalcy. Mm -hmm. um, I Honestly, I, so I'm, I'm working at the hospital this week and I hate having to wear a mask. I hate having to wear a face shield. Mm -hmm. I hate not being able to be as social as I normally would be. Um, yeah. It's it's difficult, and I, you know, I, I under I understand what you know. There, there's different sorts of pain, like Gene's talking about. You know, there's the isolation that, that just there's so many levels of it that are part of this. That I think that having a vaccine is going to be very important, and I think it, it's so important that we get a vaccine, but also we get the vaccine right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was actually something we talked about with Elena as well. And she kind of discussed sort of the different um, approaches that could possibly be taken with that, for the tar targeting the virus versus suppressing the host immune response. Do you have a sense of what might be the best tack to take for that or? No, I'm a neurologist. Yeah. <laughs> and if you've been like listening in on other people's conversations, but <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm going to leave that to them and mm -hmm. hopefully we get something that, that works really well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, real quick, one more question. If that's, if you have time. Oh, yeah, sure. Awesome. Um, Brian was wondering how the presence of COVID-19 has generally affected the procedures, time and care taken in carrying out these clinical trials, I guess. You sort of talked about that earlier where you basically had to kind of stop um, while that's happening. And then also um, for along the lines of administering treatment and monitoring um, compliance and data collection, all that as well. So some of the things that were, you know, we had to rewrite the, well, not, not myself, but the companies have had to rewrite the protocols to put in place um, new procedures in case that there's another um, period of time where we have to socially isolate. So it wasn't built into the protocols where we could send health visitors to the home to do heart tests or blood tests. 
or it wasn't set up such, such that we could do our monitoring remotely. But now we've tried to put things in place so that going forward, we can do those things if we have to. Um, ultimately, we think that the best assessments are in-person assessments, but, and we're trying to make sure that what we can do is maybe have the initial assessments be in person, maybe the last assessment in person, but we're trying to put in place all of the safety procedures between those visits such that we can ensure that we're creating a, an environment that's, that's as safe as possible for the patients. Safety is everything. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, he was also wondering if there's any tips for enrolling or participating in clinical trials during this time. Uh, just talk to your clinicians. Uh, for us, we're, we're trying to make sure that, um, you know, the company certainly is wanting us to reopen as soon as possible. So they're going to know which sites are open for any particular trial, but always your source for, for clinical trials, which sites are participating is clinicaltrials.gov. Okay, good to know. Uh, Nate, do you have any more questions, Kristen? No, I think that wraps it up. Um, I do want to ask one though that we asked Alina that I thought was was good. If you had one thing that you wanted the general public to know about COVID or about the pandemic, I think you probably already alluded to that with your your mask advocation. Wear your mask. Yeah. <laughs> good. Good. And I, wash your hands. Yeah, I right. think that's a good note to end on. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. We're, we're all in this together. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Tim. We really appreciate your time. No, absolutely. Right? Sorry I was late. No, no problem. Um, thank yes. you so much. I really appreciate it. And we're going to share this on the Soul Stories page so that community members can come and, and watch if they weren't able to participate yeah. live. Great. Um, thank Great. you so much for stopping by. Cheers. Here. Bye, Tim. Thank you so much. Sure. See ya. Bye. Awesome. Cool. Well, that was really cool to hear. <laughs> um, and yeah, very different perspective from Elena's, which I thought was was pretty neat. Uh, and definitely upsetting to think about the scenarios in which, you know, people have to start choosing who gets hospital beds. It's not something we want to, yeah. it's not a place we want to go. Um, so yeah, let's, let's all wear our masks. Wear your mask. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, it's, it's good to hear somebody outspokenly supporting that. Um, I'm not sure why it's a controversy, but <laughs> anyway, I guess we're going to say thank you for everyone for tuning in. If you've made it all the way to the end with us, thank you yeah. so um, that you're amazing. Um, well, yeah, thank you so much for supporting us. Danny, do you want to chime in at all to close out? Um, yeah, just to go off that, it was really exciting to see everyone participating in the chat and um, thoughtful questions and comments and just having very different perspectives on COVID. Um, yeah, thanks for organizing this, Kristen, and hosting Hamish. Like, this is this this is a really cool initiative. Cool. Thanks, Danny. Yeah, thank you everybody for for participating and and being here tonight. Um, and I guess that's it. Stay tuned for for more upcoming events through Soul Stories. Um, and feel free to come back and check out the stream or recommend it to other people who couldn't be here tonight. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.